Today we're in chapter 13. We're going to begin reading here in Ezekiel chapter 13 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 6, and we'll get into our study. And this is a chapter that deals with lying prophets. And so we're going to be looking at, at that particular subject tonight as we continue our study here in the book of Ezekiel. So chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 6, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy, and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, your prophets are like foxes in the deserts. You have not gone up into the gaps to build a wall for the house of Israel to stand in battle on the day of the Lord. They have envisioned futility and false divination, saying, Thus says the Lord. But the Lord has not sent them, yet they hope that the word may be confirmed. Now, Ezekiel has been prophesying judgment, judgment that is to come. As we've been looking at the last few chapters, that's what we've seen. Judgment is going to come on Jerusalem. Judgment is going to come on the rulers. Judgment is going to come on the king. But now what he wants to do is he wants to bring a word of judgment to false prophets. You see, during this season in Israel's history, false prophets rose and had tremendous influence. It's interesting if you begin to note that. You can see that Ezekiel and Jeremiah, both prophets who prophesied in similar times, you know, I believe that um, Jeremiah prophesied something like 627 years before Christ to about 580, and Ezekiel prophesied something like 592 to 570 B.C. So they basically had ministries that overlapped. We know that Ezekiel's prophecies took place while in captivity in Babylon. Jeremiah's prophecies took place while he was there in Jerusalem. And so they both were prophesying, and both of them were prophesying about a variety of things, including the false prophets who had been rising up, and false prophets, and we're going to look at that subject tonight in some detail, but false prophets had been rising up and had been making false statements in the name of God. You see that in Jeremiah. Let me give you a couple of scriptures just to point that out. Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule by their own power. My people love to have it so, but what will you do in the end? Jeremiah 23, 13, and 14 I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied by Baal and caused my people Israel to err. Also, I have seen a horrible thing in the prophets of Jerusalem. They commit adultery, walk in lies. They also strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns back from his wickedness. All of them are like Sodom to me and her inhabitants like Gomorrah. Jeremiah 29, 8 and 9, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause you to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. And so Jeremiah was dealing with false prophets as well as Ezekiel, people who are rising up, prophesying things that were not of the Lord. And that's what we're seeing here. Notice in verses 1 and 2 how it says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart, Hear the word of the Lord. Speak to those who are prophesying out of their own heart is what he's saying. Now, he's to prophesy against the false prophets because the false prophets are influencing the people. These people are not genuine. And the reason that they're being declared here as being not genuine is because the Lord is not the one moving them. Notice how he says they prophesy out of their own hearts. These are people who are speaking by their own authority. What they're giving is fleshly, polluted messages right from their own imagination. They're misled in that they're speaking from their own imaginations and they're giving their own opinions. Again in Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 14, it says, The Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I haven't sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. 
And so that's what false prophets do. They prophesy falsely. They give false visions. They give things out of the deceitfulness of their own heart. You see, the heart is desperately wicked. It's deceitful. It's filled with self-inclination. That's why we need a new heart. That's regeneration. That's why we need God's Word to be written on the tablets of our heart. You see, because the heart represents the inner man. It represents the internal motivations and a variety of things that relate to that. And God wants to give to us a new heart because the old heart, representing the old nature, is filled with itself, selfish ambition. And when it has a tendency of speaking, it has a tendency of speaking things that aren't necessarily things that God would agree with, you see. And the false prophets are prophesying out of their own heart. They're speaking concerning their own, through their own motivation, and they're developing their own ministries. And God is saying here, prophesy against them because they're not speaking what I have spoken. Notice how it says it in verse 3. It says, thus says the Lord God, woe to, woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, your prophets are like foxes in the deserts. You have not gone up into the gaps to build a wall for the house of Israel to stand in battle on the day of the Lord. They've envisioned futility and false divination, saying, thus says the Lord. But the Lord has not sent them. Yet they hope that the word may be confirmed. You see, when you study your Bible and you look into the Old Testament, you see that genuine prophets are those who are directed by God. And a genuine prophet always speaks consistently with God's Word. In the book of Numbers, in chapter 12, verse 6, it says, Hear now my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. God says, I make myself known to him. If there's a prophet amongst you, I'm the one who reveals myself to him. But false prophets speak out of their own spirits. That means they have no genuine revelation. And, and so God is speaking about that. And notice how he says it in verse 4, O Israel, your prophets are like foxes in the desert. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Foxes in the desert speaks of vermin. It speaks of destructive scavengers who are there causing damage. And he's saying that's the fruit of the false prophet. That's the fruit of a false teacher. Spiritual damage. Because like the foxes go in and ruin the vines and do a lot of malicious mischief, even so false teachers will enter in and bring destruction. When he says in verses 5 through 7 that you haven't gone into the gaps to build a wall for the house of Israel to stand in battle, he's saying, listen, genuine prophets are to call the people to be prepared for spiritual and physical onslaught. They're supposed to be preparing the people for a coming judgment. But the people are not ready because the false teachers are coming in, the false prophets are coming in, giving messages from their own heart. They're, they're giving a, a prophetic formula. They're speaking, thus saith the Lord. That's the prophetic formula. But they're not using God's authority. These people are self-appointed. And somehow they're hoping that their message will be confirmed as being true. And God says in verse 7, I just want you to know, I haven't sent them. Verse 7, have you seen, have you not seen a futile vision? And have you not spoken false divination? You say the Lord says, but I haven't spoken. And so God is speaking and saying, listen, you're speaking in my name, but I'm not the one who's speaking. I am not speaking to you. I'm not speaking through you. You're speaking something falsely. Now, in the Old Testament, you had those false prophets, but Jesus, interestingly enough, in the New Testament, warned the church that there would be a continuation of false teachers and false prophets. If you take notes, Matthew chapter 7, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 and 16, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Jesus said, I'm giving to you a warning. Even as in the Old Testament you had false prophets, even in the New, you will continue having those who are false. They're speaking God's message, at least claiming to do so. But he says, all you need to do is look at the fruit of their life. Look at the attitudes of the person and the actions of that person. See whether it lines up with what you know the Word of God to say, and you can test these people. False teachers, false prophets. Let me give you a few things that are very practical. We're living in a day... And there, there are tremendous amounts of deceivers that have gone out throughout this world and continue to deceive, even as they themselves are deceived. 
It's interesting, when you look in Matthew chapter 24, and the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking concerning conditions that will exist just prior to his return, when he's asked the question concerning the conditions that will exist, the very first thing he points to is deception. As you know, he says, uh, take heed that you are not deceived. And he repeats that three times throughout the book, uh, rather the chapter, 24th chapter there. No less than three times, Jesus repeats the same warning, be careful that you're not deceived. You know, a lot of times when we speak about the last days, and there's a variety of things that you can, you can actually categorize, you can, you can begin to point out an, uh, a lot of things that the Bible speaks concerning the situations and conditions of the last days. It's not difficult to do that. You can go through the New Testament, and you can find quite a number of Scriptures that give to us the conditions that will exist. It's interesting to me, though, when Jesus is asked, what is the primary sign of your coming? And all of these things are going to come to pass. The primary thing, what is the sign of your coming is the question. Jesus' answer is, the sign of my coming is deception. There's going to be a tremendous amount of deception. You see that very clearly in the first three verses of Matthew chapter 24. It's deception. It's people speaking in my name, claiming to bring a message from God, who are bringing people into a false sense of security, which was taking place during the time of, of Ezekiel. And so let me give you a few things that can help you as, as you want to be a New Testament person who is who's aware of the situations and conditions that, that surround you. What is, a false, uh, what is the fruit of a false teacher? Well, one, a false teacher is going to add or subtract from the gospel. You can, you could, that's a number one thing you'll see about false teachers. They add to the gospel or subtract from it. A false teacher is going to come and tell you something like this. I've had them tell me this, and, and you probably have too. All of us have encountered false, false teachers. They'll say something like this. They'll say, well, I believe that the Bible is true insofar as it is correctly translated. You know, but in the areas where it's, there's mistranslations, you can't trust the Bible. I mean, people say that I can actually, that's an actual quote. The Bible is God's Word insofar as as it is accurately translated. That's what Mormons will tell you, insofar as it is accurately translated. But they also will bring the Pearl of Great Price, Doctrines of Covenant, Doctrines and Covenants, Book of Mormon, along with them, and say that these are companion helps to Scripture. And so what you end up with is you end up with deceivers who are telling you the Bible is not enough, that the Word of God is not enough. When Paul was writing concerning this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul said, even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Even if an angel from heaven preaches to you a gospel. Let me remind you, where do the Mormons say that their books come from? From the angel Moroni. I mean, this is something that Paul spoke about 2,000 years ago. When Muslims will tell you, that the Quran is God's holy book, they also tell you that it came through Gabriel. The same kind of thing, Paul spoke about this 2,000 years ago. People who are bringing a false message will always say something like the, the Bible is fine, but you need our books, you need our study guides, you need our new revelation. I had a young, well, that's not true. She wasn't young. I had a woman. I was young. I was 22, and she was an old woman. She was in her 30s. <laughs> and she had come to my mom's house when I was in the military, and I had just gotten out, and my mom had started speaking to her. She was a Jehovah's Witness. And um, she wanted to teach me the truth. She wanted to indoctrinate me, indoctrinate me in Jehovah's Witness theology. And I was already aware of some of the, the error of what she was believing in all because I'd begun visiting with Jehovah's Witnesses and began doing some basic research on their theology and all. And, and I knew that she was in error. I knew that things that she believed and would want me to believe were in error. And so we had a conversation, and as we were, we were speaking, I said, listen, I'd like to issue an invitation to you. And she said, and what would that be? I said, I'd like to invite you to meet with me and discuss the things of God. And well, naturally, that's what she wants. That's why she came. That's what she was trying to get accomplished. And she said, sure, of course, I'd love to do that. I said, we can meet on, I think it was like Wednesdays. We can meet on Wednesday afternoons if you'd like, once a week if you want. 
Yes, I'd love to do that. I said, but here's the thing. I want us together just to read the book of, of John, the Gospel of John. That's what we'll do. And I said, we'll go through the Gospel of John together, and, um, and we'll see what John's Gospel has to say. She said, I can't do that. I knew she couldn't do that because in the Jehovah's Witnesses, they teach you that if you just read the Bible, you're going to be lost. You have to read the Bible with their materials because they believe that the material is equivalent to what we consider the Holy Spirit's leading and teaching to be, though they deny that there is such a thing as a Holy Spirit. And so they believe that their books are equivalent in terms of truth to Scripture itself, and they will not read the Bible with you. They will read the Bible with their aids or their helps, and that's what they basically, that's what she said. She says, I can't do that. I said, why can't you read the Bible, just the Bible? Why do you have to read the Bible with these things from your organization? And she didn't have an answer. She wasn't able to present it. I already knew that was true because I'd done my research and knew that she wouldn't do that. My challenge was simple. It was saying, let's get into the Word of God. Listen, false teachers don't want to read just the Word of God. They want to read the Word of God along with the things that they've been taught so they can present that to you. It's the number one thing that you'll see <clears throat> with a false teacher is they try to add to the gospel <clears throat> or they remove some things from it and they want to give things like their books, their guides, and their new revelation. But the Bible says in, in Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. And so the Word of God is sufficient. Secondly, false prophets will draw disciples after themselves because they're really seeking spiritual converts to their way of thinking. They're not bringing you to the kingdom of God. They're bringing you to their organization, which very often they equate with the kingdom of God. And so for them, it's very important for you to become one of their converts. And, and they work overtime to try and make sure that you follow after them. Well, according to Acts chapter 20, verse 30, Paul said, from your own number men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. Listen, when people get saved in this fellowship, I am not trying to make them a follower of David Rosales. God help them. I, I, I don't want that at all. And I don't want them to become a Calvary Chapelite. That isn't what Jesus said. Jesus did not say, go out into all the world and make them a follower of Calvary Chapel. He said, you're to teach them all things that I have commanded you. You're to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What you're supposed to be making are disciples of Jesus Christ himself. That's the bottom line. Should they choose to fellowship here and be equipped here through the Word of God, that would be a great pleasure to me. But my key is for them to be converted to know Christ, to know Jesus Christ, and to be set free by him. It's like what John the Baptist said concerning Jesus in, in John chapter 3, verse 30, when he said concerning Jesus, he must increase, I must decrease. A false teacher is very busy trying to have spiritual scalps, very busy trying to fill up their quota of people that they have brought to their new organization. A third thing that you can see about false prophets is they're greedy. They're greedy for material gain, and they use people for personal gain. You see that quite often. In the book of Titus, in chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, Paul, speaking about this, said this. He said, there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach. And that, he said, for the sake of dishonest gain. And that for the sake of dishonest gain. They will make a profit off of you. False prophets are greedy for material gain, and they use people for personal gain. You know, when Paul was speaking concerning himself and his ministry, he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, I'm ready to visit you for the third time, and I will not be a burden to you, because what I want is not your possessions, but you. After all, children should not have to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I don't want what is yours. I want you. 
I've mentioned this to you before many years ago. I received a, uh, in, in the mail, this is when our church was less than a year old, I was opening up mail, and there was a check in one of the uh, envelopes, and I recognized the name of a young woman, and I knew her and her husband. And I hadn't seen them for a while. And it said, my tithe. And, and I wrote her a letter. And in the letter, I, I said something like, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that you consider this your home fellowship, and I appreciate the fact that, that you sent a gift to the Lord. But I quoted the Scripture to her. I said, but the bottom line is this. We don't want your money. We want you. We want you. I said, I haven't seen you. I haven't seen you. And it would be good if you were here in church in fellowship getting in the Word of God. You know, false teachers want the money. But a genuine teacher wants the person, wants that person to grow, wants that person to be loved, wants that person to be equipped, wants that person to serve, wants that person to mature in the things of Christ. That's what genuine teachers are supposed to do. A fourth thing about false prophets and false teachers is they have no love for God's children at all. They have no love for God's children whatsoever. Jehovah's Witnesses became very famous for their um, belief that blood transfusions are forbidden by God. Some of you already know this. Perhaps some of you don't. They became very well known for being anti-blood transfusions. They equated transfusions with eating blood, and they would point to Levitical law, and they would say, the law forbids that we eat blood, and so when you're receiving a transfusion, they would reason, you are eating blood, and therefore you are violating God's Word, and thus, they became real well known uh, for allowing their children to die uh, without receiving blood transfusions. And, and Americans uh, in the 40s especially were in outrage about this because they were allowing children and, and those who could have been saved through a, a blood transfusion, they were allowing them to die. They were resisting that. And, uh, and it, it really just demonstrates, I believe very strongly, a lack of love for people, just a flat-out lack of love. Jesus, when he was speaking of the way false teachers are and all, in Matthew 23, verse 4, said it like this, he said, they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They, they put a burden on you that they themselves will not carry. A fifth thing, false prophets have followers that become like them, but the result is they bring the gospel into disrepute. I've had that conversation more than once with people who have watched somebody on TV, a, an unbeliever who has watched some guy on TV you know, somebody's asking for a lot of money or claiming to have some kind of spiritual authority and some kind of power, and, uh, and they mock, they mock the gospel because of these people. I have a friend of mine who's a Calvary Chapel pastor now, but many years ago before he got saved, he was sharing on, on one occasion how he would turn on a certain Christian channel and he'd, he'd smoke pot just to watch them acting weird on TV. And he said, that was my form of entertainment. He said, I get loaded and I'd watch them bouncing around and shouting things out and doing all kinds of weird things. And I would be thinking to myself, if that's Christianity, who needs it? And you want to know something? There are quite a number of people who actually still think that way. It brings the gospel into disrepute. And, and, and people say, well, if you're a believer, do you believe like these people I spoke to? Are you like these people over here? And I'll tell you, it brings the gospel into disrepute. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, There were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. A sixth thing about false prophets, and this is a key, and this is something to be aware of, is they change Jesus Christ from being the Son of God, second person of the Trinity, and our Savior. They change him. I got an interesting letter this week. Somebody was listening to K-Wave, and um, got angry enough to write me a letter. 
And I said, Roll, you really could just call me. <laughs> no. <laughs> you didn't have to write me a letter. No, they got upset. They got a, I just was reading it. I, I just responded to it yesterday, but I reread it again. And um, they were angry. They said, you misrepresented my faith. I was listening to you on K-Wave, and you misrepresented what we believe as Mormons. And they went on to tell me that um, Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. And they went on to say they believe in the preexistence of the human soul. See, these are things that some of you may not be aware of. Perhaps some of you are familiar with this. Mormons believe that Jesus Christ is the spirit brother of Satan. Did you know that? How many of you knew that? I, I'm, I, yeah, how many of you? Now put your hand down. Very good. How many of you didn't know that? I should have asked that. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> they believe that. They believe that Jesus Christ is the spirit brother of Lucifer. They even gave me scriptures to try and back it up. They said, you know, I want to prove my point, and they gave me out-of-context scripture, which is normally what they do. It's out-of-context because they don't read the Bible. And uh, they also believe in the preexistence of souls. How many of you knew that, that they believe in preexistent souls? They believe that. Do you remember sometimes in cartoons how there'd be in the cartoon, there'd be a little baby up in heaven, and then it would be brought by a stork and, and all of that? Well, Mormons believe in a pre-existent soul that takes a human flesh, a body, upon itself voluntarily so that it can be exalted into godhood. That's what Mormons believe. And so once again, you know, this person writing me said, well, look at how God said to Jeremiah, I knew you before you were born, as an argument for pre-existence. I mean, there are numbers of things that these people believe that Americans in general have no knowledge of. And so when somebody like, like me, when somebody like me stands up and says, this is error, I get people angry. I mean, I don't know if any of you are getting mad at me or not right now, but that happens most every time. They say, how can you judge a brother? They're not brothers. They're not sisters. They don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. This person was saying um, to me, all God says is to believe. That's all you're supposed to do. And then gave me several scriptures about believing that Jesus is the Son of God. All you need to do is believe. Is that right? And there is... The word belief simply means just to have faith in something. It, 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 that's kind of where this person was going with that. You just have to believe. It's kind of like that mentality, all roads lead to heaven. All roads do. And people who do that, who say that, and they do say that. You've heard it. I've heard it. No, all roads go to the same place. All roads go to heaven. Is that right? So, next time you take a business trip and you're in Philadelphia and you're wanting to come back to L.A., jump on any plane. <laughs> Just get the first one that's leaving because they all go to the same place. They don't. You mean, you mean there's a destination and there's a right way to get there? It'd be like me saying, all roads lead home, so I'll just drive out that driveway tonight and eventually get there. I don't think so, because I live in a specific location and it takes time to get there and I have to know the way to get there. You see, that's, that's what a lot of people are like. And, and I'm telling you, in this society that we live in, where it is, they really think it's more loving to let people die in a lie, I'm just amazed by that. I'm amazed by that mentality. This individual who was killed in church, the abortion doctor that everybody knows so well, who did late-term abortions and did multiple thousands of abortions. I forget the exact number. Some of you probably know. I forget the number. It was in multiple thousands of abortions is being presented as, as a hero, a martyr, a man who, who took infants out of a mother's womb, plunged a medical instrument in the base of their skull, and slaughtered these children 
is a hero. But somebody like me who stands up and says, there's something wrong with somebody who murders a baby. No, I'm the evil one. I'm judgmental. I am the new breed of terrorist. Because according to our State Department, you know, guys who think like I do that that's wrong are very dangerous. Probably have a gun too, don't you? You know, they're dangerous. They're that way. And I'm telling you, we're living in a time when evil is good and good is evil. And when you make a man a hero, for me, I'm thinking, this guy was an usher in a church? Where was the pastor in all of this? Why didn't that pastor take him aside, sit him down and say, listen, what you're doing is unconscionable. You are slaughtering the innocent. You are killing babies. I can't trust a man who slaughters children. I can't. There's something wrong with that man. I've said this before, and it's true. And I brought it up when Columbine happened, and I said this. I said, do you think that the safest place for a child ought to be a classroom? Now, I want you to think about that. Perhaps you haven't heard me ask that question. Do you think that the safest place for a child should be a classroom? And the overwhelming majority of the church, when that went down, when I asked that, I said, how many of you think that? So many, yes, I believe the safest. Well, look, at we're, we who are parents, we drop our baby off at kindergarten, first grade, whatever. I want them safe in that classroom. There's no doubt about that. And I think that ought to be a secure location. They ought to be 100% safe in that classroom. Nobody would argue otherwise. But I said to the church, and I still believe this, the safest place for a child is not a classroom. The safest place for a child ought to be the mother's womb. And when you kill a child in a mother's womb, you will kill a child in a classroom. That's how it works. And when we don't value life when we don't value it for what it is, it's going to be taken in every sphere from the infancy to the old. That's what happened in Nazi Germany. We see that kind of stuff happening here in the United States. And then we get upset because a man who is killing children is taken out. Now, I, it was wrong, and I do not believe at all that the man who killed that man was justified or right in doing that. I am 100% opposed at that. He should not have done that. Of course, I'm not saying that that was a right action. It was not. What I'm saying is it's interesting how people respond to things like that. And immediately, somebody who did a malicious, evil act, he killed a man, is looked at as being as evil as that is, but the one who was killing babies is regarded as, as some hero. And I have to tell you, what a crazy, crazy world we live in when you start thinking like that. We have to be very careful because truth matters. Truth matters. And people like myself who stand up and say that it does are not always the most popular people on the block, I can tell you that. But they do. These false prophets will change who Jesus Christ is. He's no longer the second person of the Trinity. He's no longer the Savior of the world through faith in Him for who he truly is, and as a result of that, they have changed him. That's what false prophets do. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. And so false teachers, false prophets, and the Lord is speaking concerning that. Now, verse 8, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have spoken nonsense and envisioned lies, therefore I am indeed against you, says the Lord God. My hand will be against the prophets who envision futility and who divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, nor be written in the record of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord God. Because indeed, because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, when there is no peace. And one builds a wall. They plaster it with untempered mortar. Say to those who plaster it with untempered mortar that it will not fall. 
There will be flooding rain, and you, O great hailstones, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall tear it down. Surely, when the wall has fallen, will it not be said to you, where's the mortar with which you plastered it? So he says, the Lord God says this, you've spoken nonsense. In other words, you have not represented me. You should have been calling the people to repentance. Judgment is quickly approaching. But instead of doing so, you've continued giving false hope and are, are telling the people that they're not going to be judged and you're going to receive a judgment for that. You're not going to be in the assembly of God's people. In other words, you'll have no respect amongst the people of God. Your names are going to be omitted from the register of Israel, which more than likely speaks of them being blotted out of the book of life. And, and you're never going to return to the land of Israel. You're doomed to die in exile. And the reason, verses 10 through 12, is because you seduced my people, saying, peace when there is no peace. What's so wrong with that? Why not encourage the people? Well, you gave them a false security. All along, Ezekiel and Jeremiah are crying out, saying, judgment is coming, and you are giving to them false hope. And that, God would say, is a very great sin because instead of encouraging people to live holy lives, you encourage those people to stay in sin. Now, that's one of the reasons why teaching through the Bible is so important. When you take the Bible and you teach through books of the Bible, you give what is called the whole counsel of God. Believe it or not, and I think those of you who have been in this church for a while, you might believe this, but believe it or not, if I had my way, I'd probably teach mostly on fellowship. Mostly on fellowship. I love fellowship. I enjoy hanging around with believers. I like getting together with them. I like, I like having coffee with them. I like visiting with them. I like praying with them. I like talking about Jesus with them. I love that. I mean, if I had my way, almost every one of my messages would be centered on that. I have to tell you the truth. That's, that's basically what it would be about. Once in a while, I'd throw something in on family because I like family too. But I like fellowship. I like those things. When our church first began, you may not know this, most of you wouldn't know this, for the first year, I didn't teach a book of the Bible. For the first year, I taught, I taught topical studies. I taught on worship. I taught on fellowship, purpose of the church, a variety of things like that. For the first year, I was basically doing that. I had something like 53 topical studies. And one day, I started praying, and the Lord began to put on my heart to teach a gospel study, the gospel of Mark. And I argued with the Lord. I, I remember this very well. I, I was arguing. I would say to him, if I start teaching through Mark, there are going to vis be visitors who show up who are going to show up in a chapter, and they didn't get the chapters that I taught prior to that. I can teach that on a Wednesday or maybe on a Sunday night. And the Lord was laying it on my heart. He said, you need to do it on Sunday mornings. I mean, th this is real. It was like I said, I'm supposed to teach. And I was arguing with him for about three weeks. I was arguing with the Lord. At the same time, I was coming to the end of a study, and I was thinking, but Lord, what do you want me to teach? And then I'd hear him say the gospel of Mark. And I'd say, no, that can't be you. What do you want me to teach? A woman in the church, as God is my witness, a woman in the church I didn't know walked up to me and told me this, God wants you to teach the gospel of Mark. I am not kidding you. I taught it the next week. <laughs> Serious, I am not kidding. She walked up and said, God says the gospel of Mark. Whole counsel, the whole counsel of God. How can I know it if I only pick up a book and, and maybe pull a verse out of this and a verse out of that. How can I know the whole counsel of God if all I do is every once in a while have this kind of, it's called bibliomancy. I don't know if you ever use that word. I never use it, but it's a nice word I used to just know. <laughs> you know, one of these things, God, what do you have for me today? You know, you open the Bible and just put your finger down. And then, oh, wow, great word for the day, Lord. Thank you so much. You know, like that guy who said, what do you have for me today, Lord? 
Judas went out and hanged himself. That cannot possibly be a word from you. No, I'll ask you again. What do you have for me? Go out and do the same. I know that's not the Lord, you know. Because <laughs> sometimes I think people, you know, that's their style of study. It's like, it's like if you went to a movie and you in, intentionally walked into the movie when it's three quarters done. You know, you ever, have any, you ever sit down with somebody in a movie, they're not watching the show, you know, they're busy doing, and then they turn to you and say, what did they say? What are they doing? My wife does that all the time. All the time. I say, I don't have a clue, honey. I've been asleep. I don't know. Well, what did he say? No, what did he say? I said, I don't know what he said. I'm not listening. You know, because some people just do that. If you pick up the Bible and do that, then no wonder you're confused half the time. You're not getting the full story. See, the way that you grow is you actually pick it up and go through it. There are some who teach out of the Bible. There are others who teach the Bible. There's a difference. You can teach out of the Bible by just selecting a passage and giving a study out of it. Or you can start in the first chapter, first verse, the first word, and you can go through the whole book, and you can get the whole counsel of God. That's what keeps you safe. It's when you're in the Word of God. That's how you know when someone's not telling you the truth. That's how you can discern that. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, it says, We are no longer to be children, tossed back and forth by waves, carried about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of people who craftily carry out their deceitful schemes. We're not to be children just tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that enters into the church. Now, he's illustrating this by speaking of building a wall with untempered mortar. This wall that he's speaking about speaks of security. He's saying you have built a wall that doesn't provide security because it hasn't been built well. It's not capable of withstanding the storm that is about to arrive. Therefore, verse 16, thus says the Lord God, I will cause a storm, a stormy wind, to break forth in my fury, there shall be a flooding rain in my anger and great hailstones in fury to consume it. So I will break down the wall you have plastered with untempered mortar, bring it down to the ground so that its foundation will be uncovered. It will fall, and you shall be consumed in the midst of it. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Thus I will accomplish my wrath on the wall and on those who have plastered it with untempered mortar. And I will say to you, the wall is no more, nor those who plastered it. That is, the prophets of Israel who prophesy concerning Jerusalem and who see visions of peace for her when there is no peace, saith the Lord God. He's saying, listen, Babylon is going to invade. Jerusalem is going to fall. And the false prophets are going to be exposed for their lives. They gave to you a false security. They said there was peace when there is no peace. You built your life on something that was not going to withstand the storms that are to come. It's like when Jesus in Matthew 7, 26 and 27 said this, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. Great was its fall. If you build on his word, he says the storms come, but it resists because it's built on a rock. It's got a solid foundation. You build your life on sinking sand. When the storm comes, you have nothing, nothing that will protect you. I, I, you know, one of the greatest traps that I see right now for young people is when they're going to college, they start putting all their trust in the professors and they start putting their trust in the books that they're reading and the various things that they're being taught by these, by these professors, many of whom flat out are antagonistic towards faith and antagonistic towards God, flat out. Some of them are at least bold enough to tell you, I'm here to undermine your faith. And some indeed do. They'll tell you that. I had professors who did that. I feel sorry for you for being a Christian. And they undermine. They do everything they can for the entire semester or quarter to undermine you. There's something about human knowledge. There's something about human wisdom. It's very attractive. It's very attractive. Knowledge is, is a very attractive temptation. It's so, it's so attractive. It was the first one that was, was thrown out by Satan to Eve. 
you shall know was the temptation. You'll be like God. You can gain knowledge and understanding. You can be like God, knowing good and evil. The temptation to know, the temptation of power, because we know that knowledge is power. You can be a very poor person, but well-educated. And with your education and your ability to elucidate ideas, your ability, ability to speak clearly and to, to defeat people's arguments and all, you may be a poor person, but you're very capable of disarming people and, 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 and making them feel very, very stupid. And even though they have a lot of money, they're just not as smart as you. And we can get trapped by that. We can get trapped by this desire to know, this desire to have, because knowledge is power. I was in a museum in London in 1975. Huge. Some of you perhaps have been to the London Museum. Actually, it was the London Library. The London Library. And you walk in to the center of this particular library, as I recall, and there are stories, you know, the shelves that go up 30, 40 feet or more. As far as you can see, with row after row after row of books. I mean, so many books, it's mind-boggling. And I remember walking into this particular library. I was there with a friend of mine. His name's Nicky, and, and Nicky had just gotten his master's degree out of Pepperdine, and he had just written his dissertation. He had just taken his comprehensive exams. He had just gotten his master's, and he's a very brilliant man. He had, he had scored, a, he had over 4.0 very brilliant man, went on to receive two more masters as well as his doctorate. This guy was a very educated man and a very dear friend of mine. We were together there in the London Museum, and he was taken by this, and I was too as I'm looking at row after row after row after row of books. And as I'm looking at this, I'm just thinking, look at all the accumulation of human wisdom and knowledge in one place. And I started thinking, there's so many languages represented here. You go to sections and there, you name any language in the world, and, and you've got rows and rows of books written in that language. Any language that you can imagine is found there. The Greek and the Hebrew, the German, the French, the Spanish, Portuguese, you name it, just any language that you might come up with. And there are rows and rows and rows. And so as I'm looking at this, and I am really taken by it. I was a college student at the time, and I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, man, just to read one of these books would take me a summer. To read all of these books, I couldn't do it in 10 lifetimes. Then it hit me, all the languages, all the thoughts. It hit me. God knows every word in every one of these books. And that thought was kind of heavy. The second thought was, and he knows what's wrong with every one of these books. He knows where human wisdom fails. And as I was kind of thinking about that, and I was walking through the library, in the center, there was a, a glass, a large glass. It was, um, it was one of those glasses that are put over, uh, it was a book, and, and, and it was there to preserve this book, but the book was in the center of the library. I mean, in the midst of all human knowledge. So naturally, I'm thinking, what, what book is that that's got center stage? And you all know what it was. It was a King James Bible. It was a Bible right in the center of man's human knowledge, the accumulation of wisdom over the centuries. The good people of the British uh, library had made a determination to put the book of all books in the center of that library, the Bible. And as I looked at it and it said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, I had a moment of worship there where I said, you know, God, thank you so much. If I can master this one book, I don't need to master all of the rest. But I'm telling you, all this, but no, you got to be kidding. There's so much other stuff out there that's just so much better than this. And that's how people think. And God says, oh, you want to listen to your false prophets. You want to listen to your false teachers. And you're building your life on sinking sand because God said, I didn't send them. I didn't communicate to them. They're telling you peace, and I'm bringing you 
destruction. You want to believe what the world says or believe what God says? Well, God says you're believing what the world says. Verse 17, likewise, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people who prophesy against their own heart, prophesy out of their own heart, prophesy against them, and say, thus says the Lord God, woe to the women who sew magic charms on their sleeves and make veils for the heads of people of every height to hunt souls. Will you hunt the souls of my people and keep yourselves alive? And will you profane me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread, killing people who should not die and keeping people alive who should not live by your lying to my people who listen to lies? And therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against your magic charms by which you hunt souls. They're like birds. I will tear them from your arms and let the souls go, the souls you hunt like birds. I will also tear off your veils and deliver my people out of your hand. They shall no longer be as prey in your hand. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. And you have strengthened the hands of the wicked so that he doesn't turn from his wicked way to save his life. Therefore, you shall no longer envision futility nor practice divination, for I will deliver my people out of your hand and you shall know that I am the Lord. Well, the only place in the Old Testament that false prophetesses are mentioned is here in this passage. God had moved and God has used the women in Israel. We know that God used Miriam and God used Deborah. They were women who were used by the Lord. They had great honor because they did great things. These women that are being spoken of here are fortune tellers. They wore special clothing to present themselves as being spiritual. It seems that they had some kind of band around their wrists. It, it may have been as a symbol of a connectedness that they had to some occult power. It reminds me of, of the red uh, string that you'll receive from those who practice Kabbalah. When you're in Israel, and we've, we, we've had this happen more than once, we're walking through Jerusalem by the uh, Western Wall, and the practitioners of Kabbalah walk up to you and they want to they wanna tie a red ribbon around your wrist. And they'll tell you, do you want good luck? So this kind of activity is very ancient here. They would have something, a band around their wrist that was to demonstrate some kind of connectivity with power. They had head scarves here that they're referring to here. Uh, they could have been veils, it may have been caps, but what it is, it's a picture of putting something over somebody's head but from God's perspective, it's closing them off from hearing God. And so what they're doing in, in, this, in this divination that God speaks about is they're actually hunting souls. And what that simply means is they're actually keeping people from having life through God. And the thing that he says here is that the people are more than willing to listen to the lies. Part of the reason why people are more open normally even as he says there in verse 19, who should not live by your lying to my people who listen to lies. Uh, one of the things about false teachers is they're usually very likable. We need to remember that Jesus was not always well received by those who heard him. In John chapter 7, verse 7, he said, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Jesus in, in John 8, 45 says, because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. So people have more of a tendency of wanting to hear deceit. That's what Isaiah 30, verse 10 says, when, when the people say, do not see to the seers and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. I don't want to walk out of that meeting feeling down about anything. I want to walk out feeling upbeat. Well, God says, I want you to know something. I'm against your magic charms. This isn't something that he considers harmless. He exposes it for what it is, and he wants to deliver his people from its influence. What's interesting, and I'll close with a couple of thoughts here. I want you to see this. Notice verse 22. This to me is a very interesting. Look, at because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. Here's something for you, and, and I want it to be something that that ministers to you, and I hope that it does. It's something, maybe, maybe this is something that 
was for me and I'm not supposed to share, I don't know. As I read that, as I read that yesterday and I read that again today, you have made the heart of the righteous sad. Do you know that sometimes people don't understand why, and I'll, I'll start naming some guys that you know, they don't understand why Rawl cries so much when he teaches. You know, I've known Rawl for many years. I don't even remember exactly when I met him. I think I might have been about 27 years old when I met Rawl. He played first base on the West Covina softball team. And our team played against Rawl's team when he used to play ball. He was a young guy. I met him when I was about 27 years old. That made him about 92. <laughs> he was probably 29 or 30 when I met him. He's 61 years old, going to be 62 years old in August. I've known him a long time. And I've known his ministry for a long time. And whenever Rawl teaches, he weeps. I see it all the time. Traveled with him many times, many countries. And we've had meetings where just the guys get together and, and we pray and, and Rawl weeps. I've seen him cry many times. I can, I can name guys that you know who break down and weep when they're teaching. Guys whose hearts are touched. And, and I can tell you, I have taught and I have wept and I've had people approach later on saying, what's he so upset about? What's he got to cry for? I have heard that so many times. You know how I'll say sometimes, forgive me for weeping? Part of the reason is because there are people who will go out saying, what's that all about? What's he crying about? It's a big deal. What a bummer. Those are the things I hear that you may not hear or perhaps you've heard them or said them yourself. Why? Why do people like Rawl and others like him cry when they teach because their hearts are broken for people because the people are lost because they're lost because pastors like me hear pain after pain after pain after pain stories after stories of tears and broken hearts lost children and lost health lost jobs and lost homes lost hopes and lost dreams and it hurts it hurts it breaks our heart and i especially hurt when i see jesus's name not being honored by those who love him or claim to it grieves me when I turn on a TV and I see a false teacher saying that Jesus gave him this message and all these innocent sheep sending money to this charlatan. And I used to stand up and I would, I would name names and, and I would say, this is wrong, watch out. And you can't believe the anger that people would show because they love the lies. They love the lies. Who doesn't want to have more money? Who doesn't want to have perpetual health? They want that. When God says, there's, they're saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And so when God is speaking here, he actually says, the lies you have made, because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. This, he says, bothers me. Those who love the Lord will always be saddened when evil is rampant. They will always be saddened when it seems that evil is triumphing. It will always be painful to see people's lives because I have seen it for a long time now, believing a lie and ending up hurt. You see what happened? These false, prophetes, false prophetesses strengthened the hands of the wicked. Their words emboldened evil people to remain in their evil way of life. They never called them to repentance. And so God says, I'll deal with you. 
Verse 23, you shall no longer envision futility nor practice divination because I'm going to deliver my people. I will deliver them from your false influence and you shall know that I am the Lord. And that's how it works. God always has the last say and God always brings deliverance. May we be those who actually care about what truth really is. May we really love the Lord and His Word.